Hello and welcome to GD Express with Phuket Pulse for another GD Science screencast. Today we will have a look at a full GD Science practice test. Um, so that will take some time, but stay with me. You will get a lot of insights here um, what's going to happen on the GD Science test, and uh, you'll definitely get some ideas on how to pass, how to get a better score. So stay with me. If this video helps you in any kind of way, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the like button or subscribe button below. All right. So before we start with the test, let's have a look at the science topics first. So what's on the GD science test? There will be approximately 40% of the test focusing on life science. 40% on physical science, so chemistry and physics, and 20% will be on earth and space science. The test includes items that test textual analysis and understanding, so reading comprehension and data representation and inference skills. So some questions might be based on a text only, others on a graph or table only, other questions might be based on both a text and a graph or a table and you have to be able to extract the important information from this and infer based on information given to you. And about 50% of the items are in scenarios in which two or three questions are based on a single stimulus or text, graph and so on. So many longer texts and graphs will not only have one questions related to them but several. The test topics again reading for meaning and science, designing and interpreting science experiments, using numbers and graphics in science. So everything very general you don't need to memorize uh, a lot of vocabulary most of it will be given to you. You have to be able to infer from the information that's given to you and apply the sign being able to apply the scientific method the test will take about 90 minutes and there is no break on the test on the test on, uh, that you will take on the computer the calculator is accessible via the test screen and most questions will be multiple choice style some other questions are fill in the blank or drag and drop and things like that okay i don't want to talk too much about the style of the test let's get started with our questions okay question one use the following passage for items one to three so here we already have a scenario respiratory homeostasis involves regulating the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood the exchange of gases takes place between the alveolar sacs in the lungs and the capillaries. Blood leaving the lungs in the capillaries will have partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide in amounts that are similar to the average values found in the alveoli. If the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood is different from the amount in the alveoli, chemical receptors detect the change and alter and alert the respiratory system to respond. Okay, we see we get quite a lot of information here on the respiratory system. It's about respiratory homeostasis, so keeping the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide in our blood in balance and the gas exchange and where it takes place. So, question one, which of these responses best indicates high levels of carbon dioxide in the blood? A, fever, B, coughing, C, rapid breathing, D, excessive urination. So when there is a lot of carbon dioxide in the blood, what does our body do? It's very likely that we find this information here in the text somewhere. Okay, we get some information in the last bit down here. If the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood is different from the amount in the alveoli, chemical receptors detect the change and alert the respiratory system to respond. And if there is are two high levels of carbon dioxide in the blood, we want to get rid of them. The respiratory system response, best response to that would be breathing more quickly to get rid of the extra carbon dioxide. 
rapid is another word or a synonym for fast quickly so the correct answer here is C rapid breathing our item 2 involves a graphic using the information in the passage identify and mark an X on the location of the exchange of gases again let's skim the text quickly for important information here it says the exchange of gases takes place between the alveolar sacs in the lungs and the capillaries. So we can have a look at our uh, graphic here of the lungs and we see here it zooms in and we see alveoli and capillaries. That's what the text tells us, alveolar sacs and capillaries where gas exchange takes place. We see as well carbon dioxide going out of the blood, oxygen going into the blood, so we can mark an X right here, or we can mark an X on that small dot where it zooms in. Number three, based on the information in the passage, the respiratory, cardiovascular, and nervous systems work together to regulate what? Okay, this whole text is about regulating oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood and the exchange of these gases and how much of carbon dioxide and oxygen is in the blood and the response of the body if that gets out of balance. So all of them work together to regulate the blood gas composition. How much gas how much carbon dioxide, how much oxygen is in the blood. All right. Use the following passage and diagram for item four. During flu season, proper hand hygiene is the best way to reduce the spread of infection. Some viruses can live up to eight hours on surfaces made of plastic and metal. Viruses can, can be transmitted when students rub eyes and noses and then touch a surface. Examine the elementary classroom map in the following diagram. Okay, what do we see on this classroom map? We see books and magazines, toys, student desk, computer keyboards, the teacher's desks, class pet, window and the doorknob. Identify the three surfaces that should be cleaned most frequently to reduce the spread of viruses to students by marking an X on the three labeled locations on the map. Okay, so the most important information that we get here in the text is, um, yes, here, some viruses can live up to eight hours on surfaces made of plastic and metal. So these are the surfaces we want to clean most frequently. And as well thinking about, okay, which surfaces are the students, or different students most likely to touch most of the times. If we look at this, books and magazines are usually not made of plastic or metal, so we can exclude these. Same, the class pad is alive, it's not made out of plastic or metal. The window is glass. The desks are likely made of wood and that leaves us with computer keyboards which are definitely made of plastic toys which are quite likely made of plastic and the doorknob which is usually made from metal so these are the three locations we want to wipe and clean most frequently and we will mark these with an x Again, a scenario, question five to seven. Energy and nutrients pass through the trophic levels of an ecosystem when organisms feed on one another. The following image shows a terrestrial food chain common in a variety of ecosystems. The arrows show the flow of energy from one organism to the next, from flower to grasshopper to mouse to snake to the hawk. Not pictured in the image are detritivores, often called decomposers. Detritivores are important components of every ecosystem. The organisms derive energy from organic wastes such as fallen leaves and the remains of dead organisms from other feeding levels. 
The organic material that composes living things is eventually recycled and returned to the non-living environment in forms that can be used by plants. The flower in the terrestrial food chain obtains energy for life functions from the process of All right, so this is a question that asks for knowledge that you have to know. This is a very basic uh, biology. Flowers, of course, make their own food, their own uh, energy, or obtain their energy for life functions by the process of photosynthesis. They use the energy of light to react carbon dioxide with water to form glucose and oxygen. So the correct answer here is C. On the following diagram, draw lines to match each organism with its correct role in the food chain. The flower is at the very start. And as we just learned, flowers produce food via photosynthesis, so the flowers are the producers. After the producers, we have the different types of consumers, and of course we start with the first consumer, which is the primary, then the secondary, the mouse, then the tertiary, the snake, and the quaternary, the Hawk. For the next questions, Jane wants to feed her family healthy, nutritious and organic food without spending a lot of money. She decides to plant her own garden to accomplish these goals. Next to her garden she builds a cistern to collect rainwater for the plants. For plant health, Jane opts to use beneficial lady beetles, more commonly called ladybugs, to control pests in the garden. Jane learns that ladybugs are the natural enemies of garden pests such as aphids, mealybugs and leafhoppers. Ladybugs benefit plants in a number of ways. While they prefer to feed on aphids, they also eat other foods such as pollen and nectar, acting as pollinators. Jane also stays alert for signs of ant colonies. Ants that feed on the products of aphids can attack and drive off ladybugs, leaving the garden undefended. So here we get information about a small ecosystem, Jane's garden, there where she grows food and she uses ladybugs as a natural enemy for garden pests. We get some extra information about these ladybugs that they as well can act as pollinators and that the natural enemy of ladybugs are ant colonies that drive them off, leaving the garden undefended. Which of the following could directly lead to an increase in the ladybug population? A. A stabilized ant colony, B. Growing effort population, C. Increased honeybee activity, D. Declining leafhopper population. A stabilized ant colony, we just learned, learned that ants like to feed on the products of aphids and will drive off ladybugs, so stabilized ant colonies will likely lead to a decrease in the ladybug population, not an increase. If we look at D. Declining leafhopper populations. Declining means decreasing, going down. So if leaf hoppers go down, that means there's less food for ladybugs, which means they likely decrease, not increase. If we look at C, increased honeybee activity, same thing. More honeybees means there is less pollen and nectar for ladybugs, which they use as well as a source of food, which would in return mean that it's likely for the ladybugs to decrease their numbers. If we look at B, growing aphid population, again aphids are a source of food for ladybugs. They prefer to feed on aphids. That means more aphids 
more food for ladybugs and a likely increase in a ladybug population? The correct answer is B. What type of symbiotic relationship is seen when ladybugs fill the role of plant pollinators? Again, this is assumed knowledge. You should know the different forms of symbiosis. Symbiosis is a very close relationship between organisms. And there are different types of symbiosis depending on how these organisms interact with each other and who benefits and who doesn't. Parasitism is a form of interaction where one organism benefits and the other organism in the relationship is harmed. <clears throat> These two are usually called the parasite, the one that benefits, and the host that is harmed. Mutualism is a form of symbiosis where both organisms that take part in the relationship benefit. Amensalism is a form where One organism is harmed and the other organism has no effect. Commensalism is when both organisms do not, no, when one organism has positive effect and the, organism, the other organism is not affected. In our case, they serve as pollinators, the lady beetles, which means the ladybugs benefit since they get nectar as a source of food, and the plants benefit since they get pollinated. So we have a mutualistic relationship here. The correct answer is B, mutualism. Jane's garden acts as a small ecosystem composed of both living and non-living factors. Which of the following incidents could cause a severe imbalance in this environment? An extended drought, pesticides in rain runoff, addition of composted soil, genetically modified seeds. Adding genetically modified seeds would probably not have a big effect on the ecosystem. That would mean that a couple of more plants grow but they wouldn't likely affect the ecosystem uh, severely. <clears throat> Addition of composted soil uh, would likely have a beneficial effect on our ecosystem and cause the opposite of a severe imbalance. Pesticides and rain runoff. Well, they are in the rain runoff, so they will likely not be in very high concentrations. They might influence our populations of aphids, mealybugs and leafhoppers a little bit, but won't cause a severe imbalance in the environment. An extended drought. A drought is a time where water is scarce, not enough water is available. Extended means a long drought, so a long period of time where no water is available and since all living things need water to survive, this will likely cause many plants and thus many other organisms in our small ecosystem to die, which is definitely a severe imbalance. So our correct answer here is A. Our next scenario. Metabolism is the process of converting the calories in food and beverages into energy. The number of calories a body needs to carry out the basic functions of life is called the basal metabolic rate, and it accounts for 60 to 75 percent of the calories burned every day. Several factors determine an individual's basal metabolic rate. The body size and composition. The bodies of people who are larger or who have more muscle burn more calories, even at rest. The gender. Men usually have less body fat and more muscle than women of the same age and weigh and weight burning more calories. Age. As people age, the amount of muscle tends to decrease and fat accounts for more of the weight, slowing down calorie burning and lowering the basal metabolic rate. 
Okay, so here we get the information what metabolism is. We get information about what the basal metabolic rate is and the factors that help us determine a organisms or individuals metabolic rate with three hints body size composition gender and age okay according to the passage which of the people described below would have the highest basal metabolic rate male age 25 6.2 feet tall muscular female age 20 5.4 feet tall muscular male age 45 6.5 feet tall overweight female age 75 5 feet tall overweight so we just need to look at our three points here we get the information larger taller people more muscle burn more calorie men burn more calories than women younger people burn more calories than older people that means our best candidate here is a male burns more young burns more tall burns more muscular burns more which statement best explains why people with more muscle have a higher metabolism that is a quite tricky question and definitely one of the harder ones in this test and it again assumes you to know a little bit about cellular structures and how and where energy is burned so muscle tissues are organized into three types cardiac skeletal and smooth smooth muscle Muscle cells contain more mitochondria, the cellular organelles that produce energy. Muscle tissues can work without conscious thought, such as invo the involuntary heart muscles. Muscle cells contain protein filaments that slide past one another, causing contractions. Again, let's have a look at the question. Which of these statements best explains why people with more muscle have a higher metabolism? First of all, all four statements are correct statements. All are true. But only one of these statements best explains why people with more muscle have higher metabolism. Again, what is metabolism about? Metabolism is about converting the calories in food and beverages into available energy in the cell. Where does this conversion of food happen? Or where does this conversion of glucose into available energy happen? That happens at the mitochondria in cells. And since muscles or muscle cells contain a lot of mitochondria, they release a lot of energy from food they burn a lot of calories so our correct answer here is B muscle cells contain more mitochondria the cellular organelles that produce energy this statement best explains why people with more muscles have higher metabolic rate When the calories in food are converted to energy for muscle movement, what type of transformation takes place? So we already said we have the energy in food. Energy in food is bound in chemical substances such as glucose. And this energy stored in chemical bonds is chemical energy. When this energy is released for muscle movement then we see the term movement which is a form of kinetic energy whenever you read the word kinetic this is related to a form of motion of movement so our correct answer here is chemical to kinetic
Hemophilia is a bleeding disorder in which blood does not clot normally. Queen Victoria of England was a carrier of this rare genetic disorder. Examine the Queen's pedigree chart. This is assumed knowledge as well to be able to read such a pedigree chart. If you're not sure how to do this, you should revise the topic inheritance. You should as well have a look at how to do Punnett squares and how to read pedigree charts. You will definitely find another screencast on our YouTube channel on that topic. So what we see here, we see the key, which is quite important to figure out what's going on. Circles are females. Half filled in circles are female carriers. What that exactly means, you can find out when you revise the chapter inheritance. Squares are males, white square normal male, and a dark square, a male that has hemophilia. Using the information in the chart, write the appropriate number answer in the blank. Queen Victoria had how many daughters that were known to have carried the gene for hemophilia? Where is Victoria? Victoria is up here. She was married to Albert and they had quite a lot of children. They had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nine children. Of these nine children, one, two, three, four, five, six were daughters. And of these six daughters, Alice and Beatrice were female carriers. That means Queen Victoria had two daughters that were known to have carried the gene for hemophilia. A question on evolution. There are two patterns of speciation. The first, called anagenesis, takes place when a single population is transformed enough to be called a new species. The second, called cladogenesis, is the budding of one or more new species from a parent species that continues to exist. Draw a line to connect the correct word with a set of birds that best illustrates the definition. So we have our two words down here, cladogenesis and anagenesis. We have two illustrations of a form of speciation, and we get both definitions up here in the text. Anagenesis takes place when a single population is transformed, changed enough to be called a new species. Cladogenesis is the budding or splitting of one or more new species from a parent species that continues to exist. So what can we see here? We have down here at the start, time passes the further we go up, a species of a bird and over time we see it has changed into a new species that has now a different tail. Here in this picture we see this bird progressing through time, the species does not change. The parent species continues to exist, but we have a splitting off, a budding off a new species that is different from the parent species. So to connect this correctly, cladogenesis goes to the right and anagenesis to the left. Use the following diagram for item 16. What do we see here? Types of heat transfer. We see convection that involves the air. We see conduction that involves a solid. And we see radiation. Based on the information from the picture, write the appropriate term in the blank. In the process of heat is transferred from one particle of matter to another in an object without the movement of the object itself. Convection we see particles are involved, yes, but these particles move from down here up here. 
Radiation does not involve any particles. Conduction is through a solid where the particles are in a fixed position and can only vibrate. They can't move around freely. So they transfer the heat through increased vibration through the solid from particle to particle without the movement of this object itself. So the correct answer here is conduction. Use the following definitions and cartoon for item 17. Exothermic reaction. A type of reaction that gives out energy in the form of heat. Endothermic reaction. A type of reaction that takes energy from the surroundings. And we see a cartoon, a chemist mixing two chemicals, an explosion and a ring of smoke around our chemist. <clears throat> Based on the given information, write the appropriate answer in the blank. The reaction shown in the cartoon is a type of... Again, we see here, exothermic reaction gives out energy in the form of heat. Endothermic reaction takes in energy from the surrounding. We see an explosion, which is definitely a release, giving out of energy. So this reaction is an exothermic reaction. The next question is related to this pie chart. <clears throat> we see energy sources and different percentages here. Approximately what percentage of total energy comes from renewable energy? 2%, 4%, 5% or 25%? Okay, here we need to use the key which is not correct with the colors. Um, it's supposed to be 63.97 for crude oil, natural gas, 25% coal, 5.4, nuclear, 3.92, and renewable, 1.68. That leaves us with answer A. And we have to round to 2%, asks approximately. 1.68 is rounded to 2%. The correct answer is A. Electromagnetic radiation. So here we get the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation from long wavelength to short wavelengths and low frequency to high frequency. From radio waves over infrared rays to the visible light, which is split up in the spectrum here, red to violet, then leaving the visible light to ultraviolet rays, X-rays and gamma rays with shortest wavelengths and highest frequencies. Based on the information from the diagram, write the appropriate answer in the blank. Have the shortest wavelength and the highest frequencies. Again, no, we just follow the arrow, shortest wavelength, highest frequency. These are the gamma rays. Don't get confused with the visible light down here. This whole section goes into this small piece of this big arrow here. Use the following cartoon for item 20. So we see a car that breaks and stops and a person flying out through the windshield in the front. Which of the following principles of motion is not illustrated in this cartoon? Unbalanced forces, because there is no seat belt. Constant acceleration, because the velocity may vary. Inertia, because the car is at rest and the driver is moving. Transfer of momentum, because the driver and car have mass and a velocity. So what is not illustrated in this cartoon? Unbalanced forces are illustrated because there is no seat belt. Yes, that is correct. All forces are unbalanced. Otherwise, the driver wouldn't fly out of the car. Inertia, because the car is at rest and the driver is moving. Yes, that is illustrated. The car has come to rest and the driver is flying out of the car due to 
the inertia of the mass of the driver. Transfer of momentum, because the driver and car have mass and velocity. Yes, we see this transfer of momentum here. Constant acceleration, because the velocity may vary. This varying velocity cannot be illustrated by the cartoon. We can't be sure whether the change in velocity is constant or not constant. This cannot be illustrated by the simple cartoon. So the correct answer is B. Okay, let's have a look at this simple graphic here. It is a third class lever. We see the load here, effort up, and the pivot, the fulcrum, around which uh, we turn the load on the right side. Which of these objects would best be classified as a third class lever? The seesaw. In the seesaw, the fulcrum is in the middle and load and effort on the two sides of the fulcrum. This is, would be a first class lever, so it's not a seesaw. Scissors. Same thing, the effort is on one end, the fulcrum is in the middle and the load is at the other end. Scissors, first class levers. A hammer. Our hand serves as the fulcrum. The stick uh, and, and uh, where the effort is applied. And the load is the head of the hammer. So the hammer is a third class lever. The hammer included with our hand. So C is the correct answer here. Let's quickly have a look at D, the wheelbarrow. A wheelbarrow has the fulcrum at one end, yes, but the load is in the middle and the effort is on the other end. That makes a wheelbarrow a second class lever. If you want to know more about levers, check out another screencast on our YouTube channel. Use the following graphic for item 22. We see the element symbol for hydrogen. We see the atomic number top left and the nucleon number below down here, or the relative atomic mass number down here. How many protons are found in the nucleus of a hydrogen atom? The proton number is equal to the atomic number top left. That means a hydrogen atom has one proton. A chlorine atom has seven electrons in its outer shell. It can reach a full outer shell by gaining one electron. When an atom has eight electrons on its outer shell, it is considered a full shell, stable shell. When chlorine gains one electron, it will then become a chloride ion, Cl-. What does it mean when an atom such as Cl- has a negative charge? It contains one more electrons than neutrons, one more electron than protons, many more protons than electrons, many more electrons than neutrons. Since our two subatomic particles with charges are electrons and protons, and protons have a relative charge of 1 plus and electrons a relative charge of 1 minus, we get to a total 1 negative charge when we have one more electron than protons. In our example here, our chlorine atom has 17 electrons and 17 protons. So chlorine itself has no charge because we have 17 negative charges and 17 positive charges. 17 electrons, 17 protons. No charge for a chlorine atom. Now we add an electron that makes it 18 electrons and 17 protons. One electron more than protons means one more negative charge than positive charges. 
which gives us Cl minus, we have one more electron than protons. Answer B is correct. Use the following chart. <coughs> properties of metals and non-metals. So we see some properties of metals here. They are strong, they are malleable, they react with oxygen to form basic oxides, they're sonorous, and give a sound, and they're hit with another metal. They have high melting and boiling points, they're good conductors of heat and electricity, mainly solids at room temperature. The only exception is mercury, which is a liquid at room temperature. They are shiny when polished, and when they form ions, the ions are positive and they have high densities. Then we get some properties of non-metals. Brittle, they react with oxygen to form acidic oxides. They are dull when they are hit with a hammer. They have low melting points and boiling points. They are poor conductors of heat and electricity. They are solids, liquids and gases at room temperature. They are not shiny, they are dull looking usually. When they form ions, they usually form negative ions and they have low densities. How would a colorless odorless gas with a very low melting point and a high density at the boiling point best be classified as a metal because it has a high density as a metal because it has a boiling point as a non-metal because it has is a colorless gas as a non-metal because it has a melting point so first of all we can exclude <coughs> b and d Every substance has a boiling point and a melting point. It doesn't matter whether it's a metal or a non-metal. Every substance will melt at a certain temperature. Then, the confusing part here is that it says with a very low melting point and a high density at the boiling point. <clears throat> so we read high density and we see here high density that must be a metal. This is a bit confusing because it says high density at the boiling point. Which means that at the boiling point our substance can still be liquid. If it's usually a gas at room temperature, the gaseous state, it has a low density. We can cool a non-metal down so that it becomes a liquid to its boiling point and then that non-metal that usually has a low density under standard conditions now has a high density at low temperatures when it becomes a liquid. So that doesn't really give us a lot of information here. The correct answer is thus C. It is a non-metal because it is a colorless gas. Which chemical equation correctly illustrates the following statement? Magnesium burns in oxygen to produce magnesium oxide. This is assumed knowledge. We have to be able to balance a chemical reaction. Here we see oxygen and Magnesium oxide to give magnesium. That is not correct. It's not balanced. We have more oxygen on this side than on this side. We have more magnesium on this side than on this side. So definitely exclude A. 2Mg plus O2 gives us 2MgO. This is balanced and this is magnesium, this is oxygen and this is magnesium oxide. So this is a very good candidate for a correct answer. Again see here we have magnesium oxide plus oxygen gives magnesium. That is not balanced. That doesn't work out. D, oxygen plus magnesium gives four oxygen atom and two magnesium. So here we don't have any magnesium oxide at all. So the correct answer must be B. It is balanced and it matches what the information we are given up here. Another question on chemistry. Which equation is represented by the symbols shown? So we see two copper atoms here, then a molecule that is made of two atoms reacting to form a molecule or a compound that contains one copper and one of the other atoms and another 
that contains one copper and one of the other atoms. Options are 2Cu plus O2 gives us 2CuO, 2Cu plus 2O gives us CuO2, 2CO plus O2 gives us 2CuO2, Cu plus 2O gives us Cu2O2. Again, the only one that really makes sense here is the first one. We have two atoms of copper. O2 means the small two means that our both oxygen atoms are connected, they're bonded together to form a molecule. We have the, the coefficient, the large number in front, 2Cu, that means we have two atoms of copper that are not chemically bonded together. O2 with a small 2 down here means they are chemically bonded together, which we can see here, they stick together. It gives us 2 times CuO. CuO means they are bonded together, which we can see here. 1 Cu with 1 oxygen, yes, that is correct. And we have this 2 times, that is correct as well. So it must be A. The measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution is called pH. The lower the pH, the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution. Measured pH values range from 0 to 14. Strong acids, acids such as hydrochloric acid have a pH around 0 to 1. A solution of a strong alkali such as sodium hydroxide has a pH of 14. What could be inferred about the substance with a pH of 7? It is mildly acidic. It is strongly alkaline. It is slightly alkaline, not acidic. It is neither acidic nor alkaline. Since 7 is directly in the middle between 0 to 14, That means that this substance is not an acid, not an alkali, so the correct answer here is D. Slightly alkaline would be pH 8, strong alkali would be around pH 14, 13, mildly acidic would be pH 6, 5, 7 is neutral, neither acidic nor alkaline. A D. Scientists can often tell where crude oil is trapped by looking at the shape and structure of rocks. Oil tends to be located where permeable rocks are in contact with impermeable rocks at a fault line or where impermeable rocks are domed upward. Crude oil formation began millions of years ago when microscopic ocean plants and animals died. The remains were covered by many layers of sediment that eventually turned to rock. As temperature and pressure increased, the organic remains slowly changed into crude oil. That crude oil is extracted by drilling through the impermeable rocks. There are several concerns about the world population's dependence upon oil. Unless oil is used more efficiently, supplies of crude oil could run out in the next 30 years. Additionally, when oil is burned, it gives off carbon dioxide. The increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere contributes to global warming and ocean acidification. Okay, based on the passage, which statement best summarizes locations of crude oil? Permeable rocks found underground trap crude oil inside rocky domes. Oil is usually located inside impermeable rocks and underneath the ocean floor. Crude oil is found trapped in some of the sedimentary rocks of Earth's crust. In areas of high temperature, dome-shaped rocks near fault lines house most of the oil. <clears throat> so this is a reading comprehension question. What is the best summary? A is a bit specific. 
and is not right because we not only need permeable rocks, we as well need impermeable rocks. Oil is usually located inside impermeable rocks underneath the ocean floor. Again, that is a bit specific with underneath the ocean floor. Um, and it's not only impermeable rock. <clears throat> Crude oil is found trapped in some of the sedimentary rocks on Earth's crust. That is the best summary that we can get here. So the correct answer is C. If we look at the paragraph in the middle, crude oil formation began millions of years ago when microscopic ocean plants and animals died. The remains were covered by many layers of sediment that eventually turned to rock. As temperature and pressure increased, the organic remains slowly changed into crude oil. That means that crude oil is found trapped in some of the sedimentary rocks. <coughs> According to the passage, oil supplies may be depleted within the next 30 years. Which statement supports this concern? Locating oil underground is imprecise. Formation of oil takes millions of years. Burning oil contributes to global warming. Drilling for oil is time consuming and expensive. Locating oil underground is imprecise. Um, doesn't say anything about that and it says no, that scientists can often tell where crude oil is trapped. Drilling for oil is time consuming and expensive. There is not much information given on that statement as well. <coughs> Formation of oil takes millions of years, that is true, which is again, uh, this information is given in our second paragraph. And it says that, that unless oil is used more efficiently, supplies of crude oil could run out in the next 30 years. So we use a lot of crude oil plus the formation of the crude oil takes a very long time this means that C is the correct, uh, that B is the correct answer. C, burning oil contributes to global warming, is a true statement, but <clears throat> this does not support the concern that the oil may be depleted in the next 30 years. Correct answer here is B. It may be depleted because it takes a very long time to form. Based on the information in the passage, in what way does crude oil contribute to climate change? By increasing acidification of ocean water, by raising air temperature from burning oil, by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, by decreasing the oil reserves in Earth's crust. Here it's about the last sentence, the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere contributes to global warming and ocean acidification. So by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, crude oil contributes to climate change. Correct answer is C. In extreme weather events, strong winds can turn stationary objects into dangerous projectiles. A safe room is a specially designed hardened, windowless structure inside a home. It is meant to provide protection from flying debris. A home with an underground safe room would best protect a person from which type of natural hazard. An earthquake with aftershocks. During an earthquake we usually do not have very strong winds and Stationary objects are usually not turned into dangerously flying projectiles. Plus, during an earthquake, you don't want to be in an underground safe room. <coughs> Hurricanes with flooding, same thing. When there is flooding, that means that an underground room will 
likely be flooded first wildfire with smoke same problem smoke is um, <coughs> well again here uh, you won't don't want to be trapped inside a house in an underground safe room tornado with hail we have strong winds where with hail where the hail uh, grains are easily turned into dangerous projectiles so an underground safe room will best protect from a tornado with hail rip currents are narrow fast moving belts of water caused by circulation cells they flow seaward from near the shore rip current speeds are typically one to two feet per second and they can sweep even the strongest swimmer out to sea. So here we see uh, the visualization, a rip current from the near to the shore flowing seaward, as it says in the text here, near to the shore seaward, moving circularly circular cell. A swimmer can best escape a rip current by standing still in the water. Swimming parallel to the beach, floating in between the wave breaks, trying to swim perpendicular to the shoreline. <clears throat> so this is a bit of a vocabulary question. You have to know what parallel means and you have to know what perpendicular means. Perpendicular means uh, in a 90 degree angle to the shoreline that would mean swimming either out with the current or straight against the current again a rip current is so fast that it can even sweep out the strongest swimmer um, and that means swimming perpendicular to the shoreline against the current will not work to escape the rip current so D is not the correct answer Swimming parallel to the beach. The beach will be the shoreline down here. And swimming parallel is what we see on the picture here as well, the escape route. So swimming parallel to the shoreline is labeled as escape on our illustration, which makes B the correct answer. The image illustrates the Coriolis effect. The solid lines on the globe represent the path wind would take if it were not influenced by the Coriolis effect. The dotted lines represent the actual path of the wind as viewed from the equator. So very important here and labeled on the illustration as well is the path that wind would take if there wasn't the Coriolis effect. The dotted line is the actual path of, of the wind, the real path of the wind due to the Coriolis effect. Based on the image above, which of these statements best explains why wind does not blow in a straight line? Earth rotates at high speed clockwise as viewed from the North Pole. So if we look from the North Pole, do we spin clockwise? That is counterclockwise. It's not A. Earth's counterclockwise spin causes the illusion of wind traveling in a curved path. Answer B tells us that the curved path is an illusion. However, the information we get here tells us that the wind really travels in the curved path. It is not an illusion, so it's not B. Wind traveling over land in the th southern hemisphere creates areas of high pressure. We don't get any information about that, so it can't be C. The spin of Earth causes winds in the northern hemisphere to curve, 
to the right. The spin of the Earth up here causes winds in the northern hemisphere curve to the right. Yes, that is true. D is the correct answer. The gravitational pull of the Sun and the Moon influence the tides on Earth. When the Moon is in line with the Sun, the gravitational pull from the two objects combines. The combined gravitational pull produces extra high and extra low tides twice a month. These types of tides are referred to as spring tides. Which pictures show the proper conditions to produce a spring tide? Again, it tells us when the moon is in line with the sun, the gravitational pull combines and that produces spring tides. <clears throat> in picture one, moon and sun are in line. In picture two, moon and sun are in line. In picture three, moon and sun are not in line and in picture four moon and sun are not in line. So the correct answer is A, 1 and 2. A Punnett square cross yields 50% heterozygous traits, capital T and lowercase t, and 50% homozygous recessive traits, lowercase t, lowercase t, which were the most likely genotypes of the parents crossed. So we get 50% of the offspring heterozygous and 50% of the offspring homozygous recessive. Which combination gives us this outcome? If we would cross A that would give us an outcome of 100% heterozygous. If we cross B, that would, as, that would give us an outcome of 25% homozygous dominant, 25% homozygous recessive, and 50% heterozygous. So it's not B. C, we have only homozygous recessive, that means it will give us a hundred percent homozygous recessive in the offspring. D will give us 50% heterozygous and 50% homozygous recessive, that means D is the correct answer. If you want to learn more about how to construct Punnett squares, please have a look at one of our other screencasts on life science, more specifically on the topic of inheritance. Which of the following materials would be a good conductor? A vinyl floor because it does not transfer heat. A plastic spoon because it does not absorb heat. A wool blanket because it slows the transfer of heat from skin. The copper pipe because it accelerates the transfer of heated materials. Again, a good conductor is something that quickly and easily transfers heat from one place to another. A, B, C refer to the opposite. Only D refers to a fast transfer of heat. So it must be D. Four substances, A to D were introduced into a laboratory-based aquatic food chain consisting of producers, primary consumers, <clears throat> and secondary consumers. Samples were taken from each trophic level and the concentration of each substance was measured in the tissues. The data are shown in the table. Substance A and concentration in milligram per kilogram of the tissue. Substance A not present in producers, not present in primary consumers, not present in secondary consumers. Substance B is present in producers in a very high concentration, 
but not or very very low concentration present in primary consumers and secondary consumers basically neglectable that is not present substance C is to a very low extent present in producers to a higher extent present in primary consumers and to a very high extent present in secondary consumers substance D has more or less the same concentration throughout producer, primary consumer, and secondary consumer level, which explains the results of substance B. Each subsequent trophic level accumulated substance B, but could not metabolize it, break it down. Substance B was accumulated by producers, but either excreted or metabolized by consumers. Substance B could not be absorbed by either producers or consumers. Substance B was not taken up by producers and therefore not passed up the food chain. So some of these, or all of these are explanations for A, B, C or D. If we look at the explanation A, each substance, each subsequent trophic level, so from producer to primary to secondary, accumulated substance B but could not metabolize it. That means took substance B up but could not break it down. That explains situation C and not B. Producers took up substance B from the water. Primary consumers eat producers, that means we will find they will take up the substance C now in a higher concentration by eating producers and they cannot break it down so will it accumulate it will collect in their bodies and secondary consumers eat primary consumers so they eat even higher concentrations present now in primary consumers secondary consumers cannot break substance C down either so we will find very high concentrations in here. So A is not the correct answer. A describes the results of C. We are looking for a description or explanation for B. Substance B was accumulated by producers but either excreted or metabolized by consumers. So it was taken up by producers. Let's check. Yes, that is true. It was taken up by producers but either excreted or metabolized by the consumers. So primary consumer eats producer, that means it takes up substance B, but we cannot find it in the tissue of the, pro of the consumers. That means that the consumers are able to either excrete substance B or break it down, metabolize it. So answer B explains substance the results for substance B if we look at the others substance B could not be absorbed by other producers or consumers that explains our results for a 000 substance B was not taken up by producers and therefore not passed up the food chain which is a description of the results of a as well so correct answer here is answer B which is most specialized with respect to biological organization. If you need more information on biological inform uh, organization and specialized cells, please check out another screencast on life science. Most speci specialized. So a red blood cell is a single specialized cell. The skeletal muscle is a tissue which comes after a specialized cell. The lung is an organ which is the level of organization after tissue and the circulatory system is an organ system which is in our case here the has the highest level of organization. So answer C is the correct answer. In terms of biological organization we go from A to B to D to C from lowest to highest.
And we come to our last question. Bacterial cells were treated with a hormone that produces specific proteins. The hormone-stimulated cells were then exposed to four different substances, A to D. The effects of each substance on levels of various biologically important molecules are shown in the table. Which process was likely affected by substance A? So this is assumed knowledge as well. Um, you have to know the basics of DNA replication, transcription, translation and ATP synthesis, uh, which is all part of cellular biology in life science. So if you need more info on that topic, again, please check out another screencast of ours. We definitely can help you out there. <clears throat> so let's have a quick look again. A, DNA replication happens during the cell cycle before cell division and is the doubling of the DNA so that after mitosis both daughter cells have a full set of DNA of the, uh, the same as the parent cell. Transcription is a process that takes place during the making of proteins and is the copying of DNA into RNA, specifically mRNA. Translation is the process that comes after transcription where the mRNA is translated at the ribosomes into the actual protein and amino acid sequence of the protein. The ribosomes are able to read the genetic code in the mRNA and translate it into the amino acid sequence of the respective protein. ATP synthesis happens during cellular respiration where the energy released from glucose is used to make ATP at the mitochondria. So let's have a look again. Which process was likely affected by substance A? The DNA levels remained the same. RNA levels increased whereas protein levels decreased, ATP levels remained the same. So the amount of DNA did not change, that means DNA replication was not affected. The amount of ATP did not change, that means ATP synthesis was not affected. So it's either transcription or translation. Again, transcription is the making of RNA, which will then be later trans related into proteins, which is the process of translation. So we can see that RNA levels go up, which means that transcription is still working, but proteins level, protein levels go down, which means that the translation process of changing the information in the RNA into a protein is not working properly. So the correct answer here is answer C. If transcription was affected, then that or effective transcription we see in answer B. When transcription is affected, that means that RNA levels will fall. And if we don't have RNA, we can't have translation. That means at the same time, DNA levels, uh, protein levels will fall as well. Okay. If you, need to more, if you need to know anything else and if you still struggled uh, to follow me going over some of the questions, um, then think about it and think about, okay, what is, is, there, is there a specific topic I really struggled with <clears throat> while following the screencast? Start revising this topic um, so you get prepared for your GD science test. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments below. Uh, we are very, very happy to help you out and answer your questions. And again, if this screencast helped you in any kind of way, please subscribe to our channel and tell your friends that want to take the GED as well about our YouTube channel. All right, thank you very much for listening. This was Phuket Pals with another GED Science Screencast.